my great, 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 great grandchildren will be seeing this film and hear my voice and hear me playing the piano and think, my God, why is she giving us that? Well, I was a good musician and I want to give you whatever I have to give. That's what I have to give you. The first thing you learn if you want to be an artist is to see. You have to see where you are. You have to see what you're doing. You just have to see. And if you want to appreciate anything, you have to hear and you have to see. And touching is sometimes good too. My full name. Uh, do you want the Romanian, the Hebrew? I want it any way you say it. All right, it's Mary Marcus Udell Schoenfeld. How old are you? I'm 96. I was born in Romania. Romania is known as having smart women and stupid men. <laughs> Why? Well, who's ruling the country? The men? Mm -hmm. And they're not doing such a good job. Can you talk about Romania? Do you know what a pogrom is? I've heard about them. A pogrom is probably a Romanian word or a Jewish word. It means that the Jews are being attacked by the Christians. It means as many will be beaten and killed as possible with the priest and maybe even the police watching. I remember being in a room and there was one window that my mother had put a pillow in. I guess it was to block light from escaping from the room. And I sat next to Mama. Mama told me later on that I was about two years old. And I heard crying and screaming and laughter. That's my first memory. I learned very early on to be afraid. We were in a gated community, the Jews, and there was never a key for the gate. It was supposed to, we were supposed to be locked in at night. The police and the priests would charge up the, uh, the, the feelings of the community at a lecture or at a service, and then they would come and attack. We were waiting for them. We never could leave. There we were, and they had weapons, they had knives, they had anything they could hit us with. The effort was to kill. If they didn't, they maimed, they drew blood. And why not my family, others? You had family members killed? Sure, there were uncles, there were aunts, there were cousins. They did a lot of uh, slaughtering. It was very easy for us to understand how the black man felt. Here? In this country, yes. That's exactly how the Jew felt in Europe. The reason we came to this country, my father never wanted to leave because he was afraid. Uh, but we came because my brothers were getting to be the age of uh, of being brought into the army. If, if they get, got into the army, you never saw them again, and you didn't know what happened to them. Their effort was to uh, have them uh, change their religion, and uh, if they did, they got killed. But either way, you never saw them again. I was seven when we left. There were a lot of people leaving. I don't think that there was any war fought in Romania, except that the Russians were having their revolution and uh, they spent a lot of time in Romania. But there was devastation and I remember when we left the country, there were no railroads because there were no uh, rails. So we had to take 
trucks to waterways. And you take a little a boat uh, across a lake or a river, whatever, and then you got out and got into another truck. The whole trip was uh, hard. My mother, for some reason, carried pillows and uh, blankets. Uh, besides clothing, it was uh, a terrible trip until we got to the Mediterranean. We traveled south to get to the Mediterranean, where we took a ship that took us to uh, Le Havre, where we got a big ship that was called the La Touraine, and we were in the hold of the ship. Our beds were hammocks, and uh, that trip was 10 days across the Atlantic. And I remember when we arrived into the harbor and we began to see the Statue of Liberty. I can't describe to you what that sight meant. I can cry when I think of it. We were stuck in Ellis Island because my brother, Henry, had an eye infection. They wanted to send him back. Uh, of course, we had to stay in Ellis Island a little longer until he healed. So we were there for about a week, where it should have been just a day or two. So Mama had the, uh, the pillows that we were able to sleep on, on the floor in this enormous room and that's where everybody stayed. I can't understand how my mother was able to, to feed us. I, I don't remember how she got the food. We were five children. My father was a sixth child. Mama took care of all of us. How did she do it? And she wasn't the only one. I think every immigrant mother went through the same kind of thing. How did they do it? Incredible. Those were some women. When we uh, arrived, we lived with uh, different relatives until we were able to get a place of our own. And we lived on Houston Street facing Orchard Street, which was a thriving uh, pushcart community and almost everything was sold on the push cards, from food to furniture, glasses, everything was sold there. My father was scared. He was 55 years old, and Mama was 43, and there were five children. Papa had a dry goods store, a remnant store, and uh, I think we were living in that building about a week when we were robbed. It's ridiculous. If you're going to rob, why do you rob someone that has nothing? It's ridiculous, but frightening. And then after that, there was a fire in the store. The store was a, a basement. You know, you walk down four steps to get into the store. There was a fire, the policeman had, the fireman had gotten there and managed to soak everything, so everything that he owned was gone. And he never had the courage to do it again. But Mama did everything. She had five children. She did all the cooking, the cleaning, the laundry, and she had a push cart, and she sold food on the push cart but was home for us when we came home for lunch and three o'clock. And the most wonderful thing was that a music teaching company was uh, 25 cents uh, a lesson, piano or violin, open next to us, and I had not even ever seen a piano. So I checked it out and I heard sounds coming from this. I came back and told Mama about it. And I don't know where she got 25 cents a week 
to give me a piano lesson. I could practice there. And one day I came home from school and there was a piano there. Mama had saved money. It was $50 to buy an upright piano. And she had that for me. How did she do it? How did she do all these things? She even sewed our clothing. And sometimes when we were given clothing, she would make them shorter or whatever she needed to do so they fit. I remember that we got shoes and I could wear any size from size two to size 10, whatever the shoe was, my foot was. We were poor. The humor came from my father. And sometimes with kind, that kind of humor, you don't know if you should laugh or cry. It was Chaplin-esque. And from my mother, we learned sharing. We learned giving. We learned no matter how little you had, somebody else had less. And we learned to look for the good things where you lived. She took us to the parks uh, weeknights to hear the Golden Band. She took me to the library. And that was probably the biggest gift in the world, the library. I loved to read. I would go to the library and my mother had said, you start here, you end there, then you start again. I lived a lot of lives as a result. I was 10 when I started playing the piano and it never stopped. I went to bed and my fingers were moving. I was so in love with music. My teachers thought that I was very, very talented and were very happy to have me as students. And they themselves would recommend that I get a better teacher after a while. Of course, we had a problem with the money. I was offered a scholarship to uh, the David Manor School of Music, uh, which was, I think, the only scholarship they ever offered. And we couldn't accept it because I needed car fare. Did you guys have a car? We didn't have a car. Never even thought of owning a car. Of course not. First of all, it was depression. And if you knew somebody who had an automobile, he either needed it so he could work, or he had it because he was very rich. What was your experience with the Great Depression? You know, uh, I came from a very poor family, so I don't think we were as badly affected by it as people who had been better off. What was terrible was the men out of work with families depending on them. And I remember that there were a lot of homeless men that uh, lived uh, together on uh, hills and they lived on the streets. They st slept in doorways. It was bad. You were aware of hunger all the time. Sometimes you were even a little hungry. I remember apples being sold, big apples that they kept shining, and they'd hold them up, and an apple cost five cents. How many people do you think could afford that apple? Poor people eat a lot of bread, because bread was cheap, it was always there, and it was a filler. But with my mother, every plate had to be red, white, and green. So there was a little meat, some potatoes, and a lot of salad, that was cheap. I remember my neighbor saying to my mother, I don't have anything to give my family tonight. And mama took a slice of bread and cut it in half. Mm. And gave her the other half. How has the role of women changed in your lifetime? Oh my goodness, quite a bit. A woman was a housewife, and a girl was taught to do housework, to cook, to clean, to serve. And uh, that's changed tremendously, hasn't it? But that's what it was. A girl went to work so that her brothers could go to college. Girls didn't need it because they were going to be doing cooking and cleaning and taking care of a man. Uh, my father was a scholar, 
which meant he didn't work. I worked so that I could help in the family. Doing what? When I was 16, I had a job playing in a Chinese restaurant on Saturday nights. I played, you know, the songs of the day, and I was good. I was a model, a dress model for a Hattie Carnegie, a very fine store uh, on Madison Avenue. And so I had very, very beautiful things made to fit me. I wasn't tall enough to be a model, so whatever was made for me was also given to me. What were they gonna do with it when they were finished with it? So I had these beautiful dresses. I remember one dress, a dark red dress. The skirt had fur hem, and the sleeves had fur, and I wore that with sneakers. Sneakers cost 50 cents a pair. They were my own. I remember when I first started to date, I had a, a date with a guy who had a roadster. Imagine that. And the date consisted of my sitting next to him in the roadster with the top down, getting my hair blown always, and driving 90 miles an hour up Pelham Parkway. My father didn't allow boys to come into the house, and they had to come in the house or my mother wouldn't let me go out with them. So it was a fight as to who got to the door first, my father or me. If he got there first, forget the date. But I would get there as quickly as I could. <laughs> Funny. He just never thought anybody was good enough for us. At least that's what he said. Well, I was out on a date. I was 17 years old. Uh, you know, we didn't kiss in those days. I guess a lot of girls did, but I did. My brothers told me not to. And so uh, I never did. And this guy insisted, and I wouldn't. And he, I had a bracelet that wrapped itself around my wrist. He took it off, and he said, if you don't give me a kiss, I won't give this back to you. So I put my hand in his pocket, and I picked up a pocket knife. And I said, if you don't give me back my my bracelet, I'll give this to the first person that passes by. And he didn't believe me. And the person passed by I said, here's a knife. And it was Morris. <laughs> That's how we met. And then he invited me to see a Broadway show, which I'd never seen. And it was girl crazy. Uh, he was very handsome. He was very, very handsome. I don't remember whether I proposed to him or he proposed to me. We were very much in love immediately, immediately. Yeah. We liked being together a lot. Uh, there was very little money, you know, so it was sometimes a movie. It could be a walk. It could be a concert in the park. Sundays, we used to take cream cheese and jelly sandwiches and go to the park, just sit in the park. I remember it was June 4th, 1933, and it was the hottest day in 40 years. It was over 100 degrees, and there was no air conditioning. And we had a band, we had a wedding, and everybody was sweating. I, I couldn't mix with the people while I, before I was married, and there was like what you would call cocktail time. Uh, and I just sat in a chair. When I got up, sweat on my bottom. <laughs> That's how I was married, in a beautiful dress that my mother-in-law made for me. It was a gorgeous dress, and I was very well built, and it fit perfectly. I wasn't bad looking. <laughs> I really wasn't. This government had a works progress program to give work to the artists, to the actors, to the musicians, because nobody thought of them. 
There were all kinds of jobs, street cleaning, everything. But jobs for the, uh, for the arts. And so Roosevelt thought of that and there it was. The finest musicians, the finest artists, the finest actors were teaching. I had music lessons that I, in a million years I would not have been able to afford this kind of music. I learned to, to, to do it and to teach it, uh, arranging, orchestrating, composing. I learned from the finest. I was a very, very, very good piano teacher. I not only taught them to play classical music, but I also taught them to play popular music. I taught them uh, theory and harmony and, uh, and how to use it on the piano, keyboard harmony, how to use it and how to play, uh, pick out a melody by ear and add the harmony to it. I was able to play anything that I could sing, anything that I, melody that I knew, I could play it. But that wasn't unusual in my family. My father could do it on piano and violin. He'd never had any training. My father could play anything. Uh, he never had a lesson in anything, but if it made a sound, he made music come out of it. There was always music in the house. Was there music in your house? Yes. After we married, we bought a piano. He learned to play by ear through me, and we played together. We played duets. Uh, I played the harmony because I had a better ear than he did. He wanted to play the accordion, and he was very good at it. I could have been better at it because I was a better musician, but I stayed away from it. I didn't play it. That was his but he loved music. That's what really brought us together. I only learned to be athletic, uh, you know, to do athletics after I met my husband, because uh, he was very athletic. So I learned to play handball. We uh, would go to the uh, Catskills for a summer vacation. They had handball contests for men and women. The winning meant that you had a free weekend Everybody knew if we were there, we, we were going to win. After a while, they would not allow us to enter the contests. I think he was the inspiration for me, for, for doing things. He seemed to expect uh, that it would be natural for me to do these things, so I did them. We moved into an apartment and we needed paintings, and that's when I started to paint. I sold, after a while, I sold a lot of paintings. I, I don't even remember the paintings that I sold because they never stayed around long enough. What did Mars do for a living? He was a salesman of printed fabrics, dress fabrics. And uh, for some reason, when Toby was born, he started to do better. Like she brought prosperity into the house with her when she arrived. I'd had two miscarriages, and then Toby was born premature. She weighed two pounds, one ounce, and was three months in an incubator. I never, I never thought that I would ever see her. And I didn't go to see her because I, I didn't want another loss. But my husband went every day. So when she came home, she weighed just under five pounds. She didn't have eyelashes or hair and she didn't have fingernails. She was colic for a whole year. People were very moved by her because she was so little and she'd been premature. And uh, here she was, tiny, yet able to do everything that a child of her age was doing. We learned a lot from her. Oh my goodness. I was in the kitchen giving Toby her, her dinner, I think, and I had the radio on. And Toby started to cry because everything about me changed. Morris was home and I called him. I called him once and he came running in and we listened. 
was terrible. It was terrible. We didn't know uh, at what age they would stop taking uh, men. Uh, Morris was very young and uh, we started to worry because we had a child and we didn't have much money. And then they decided they were not going to take uh, men with children. And we had the child. I knew what war was. Of course, I wasn't old enough to understand it or appreciate it, but I saw the results of it. Wherever I looked, there was devastation. You know why the Jews speak Yiddish, which is German? Because when the Spaniards came in, when the Catholics came into Spain, they threw the Muslims out, but they had their lands close by. The Jews didn't have any land. And they either converted or they had to leave. There was no place to go. England and France, they didn't want the Jews. Germany was having trouble getting along. It just didn't have the smarts invited the Jews to come there because they needed help. In gratitude, we took on the language of the Germans. That's our Yiddish, it's German. And the same Germany then killed us. Did you have any family that was still in Europe? Absolutely. We had family in Romania. Romania packed them up and shipped them very kindly, thank you. They loved their Jews. They made good, good firewood. Terrible people. Tell me about Judy. It was so easy with Judy. She ate when you gave her food. She slept when you put it down. She was just good. At one point you were hospitalized? I had tuberculosis. My children were two and four, and I was in a sanitarium for three months. Did you tell people about it? No, you couldn't, because my children wouldn't have had anyone to play with. They were afraid of it. You could not talk about it. People were frightened of it because people were dying of tuberculosis. I wasn't afraid of dying, but I was afraid of the loneliness. I can be alone easily. That's not loneliness. But uh, being afraid to talk uh, about what's happening is lonely. And I couldn't talk. But luckily for me, they discovered a, a medication for it. And so I was fine and never had the problem again. When I came home from the sanitarium, I was there for three months. I had to be in bed. And I remember that every day I do a picture of Judy from a photograph. And it looked the same every day. <laughs> and uh, I had a guitar. Toby was the one that sang. She was very, very musical, very musical. I mean, she just didn't sing uh, nursery rhymes. She was singing symphonies. And uh, she would hear what was on radio. I always had uh, WQXR on. So I had classical music going all the time. And that's what she was singing before she could walk. What you have in your home is what your children pick up. You have paintings in your home, your children are going to paint, or they're going to buy paintings. You have music, they'll have music. You have books, they'll have it. Whatever they're brought up with, they'll have. Toby was a wonderful musician. Judy was always dancing, always dancing. And she would watch dances on TV and then do the same thing. As a matter of fact, I took her to a, a dance recital uh, with Maria Tallchief, who was the prima ballerina of her time. 
And when she came on stage, this little girl stood up and shouted, I can dance better than that and I never had a lesson in my life. That was my kids. All parents do the best they can and uh, if the children are successful in what they're doing and uh, their talents get a chance, uh, that's pretty good. So I was very lucky. I had really great kids and a great husband. He had one way of looking at things, which made it easier for him. What was the right way to do things? So there was no question about what he does, how he thought. It would come to him quickly. This is the right way to do it. This is the honest way. If he was in business. He never signed a contract with anybody. If he gave his word on something, that was it. Everybody else in that business, it was a tough business, signed contracts with lawyers. He didn't have to. I remember he was playing golf one day, and this was told to me by one of the people playing in the game with him. When they took the score at the end of the hole, and he was asked what he had on the hole, he gave them a whole number more than they thought he had. And they said, you're making a mistake. And he said, no, I'm not. I lost the ball. I had to pay for it. And they didn't realize that he had lost the ball because he was there, they were here. But that, he was very, very honest. Everybody trusted him. That's a great talent. That's a great gift. Very great. I was uh, a little old to start playing golf, you know. Were you any good? But I, very, I was a seven handicap. That's very low. Morris was a three handicap. I, I could never compete with him. Did you uh, compete? He was a natural athlete, as well, uh, I was, and so was Judy. But he was competitive. I wasn't. And I think that I wasn't because I didn't have the guts. That's what happened with my piano career as a, as a performer. I was a good golfer, um, but I, I, I never expected to be the best golfer there ever was. I did really expect to be the best pianist there ever was. I was really good. I was very talented. I just didn't have the guts to sit at the piano and play professionally. Were you still painting? Absolutely. I lived in a community of uh, like 80 some odd houses with two golf courses and four tennis courts. And uh, the house was on the golf course and I would be in the Florida room, where it was, which was also my studio, and see the, the beautiful landscape and the golf course and people waving to me as they played golf, went by the house. Uh, I, I liked drawing uh, from the time I could hold a pencil. I was always drawing people doing things. I like people a lot, so that I respond to them. When did you stop painting? Uh, my husband got sick. Uh, he had cancer, and I stopped painting to take care of him. I never went back to it. So that was about late 60s. He was given six months to live, but he lived nine months because he wanted to be at David's bar mitzvah. He got up on the bima. Everybody ran forward to help him get up, and he shook their hands off. He did it himself. Did he read from the Torah? He did. He did. Whatever was required, he did. He, he would set tasks for himself always. Uh, and did whatever was necessary. 
always. The, the big thing that was hard to handle was my husband dying. I had never been alone in my life and suddenly I was alone. Uh, it was hard to be alone because, you know, I was afraid of the dark and I was alone in the dark every day. That never left me. He died in great pain. And I, I was happy when he died and sad when he died. I've never stopped missing him. Although when I was 76, I fell in love. I met Paul and uh, we got married. <laughs> and I had a wonderful romance for 17 years. And he was nearly six years younger than I was. Impressive. He was a wonderful, wonderful man. Brilliant man. He was a remarkably good traveler. I had traveled before he came on the scene, but it wasn't the same. It was really not the same. He died only three years ago. I don't like being alone, but I was rarely alone. I, I came from a household and I married. I wasn't alone. And it's only in the last three years that I was alone, but I'm, I'm with my daughter who gave me a home. How do you feel about that? Very grateful. Very grateful. Do you still feel independent? Sure. She's also very smart. Not only uh, giving, but she's also uh, letting me have uh, a say. I, I, I do what I, what I wish. That's very important to me. What is? My independence. That's very important. What's the most beautiful thing in your life today? Today, the most beautiful thing, always what I'm seeing. Whatever I'm seeing is the most beautiful. You have macular degeneration? I have macular degeneration. What is it, exactly? Uh, I don't have direct vision. I only have peripheral vision. I look at you and there's a hole. I can't see your face unless I look up. So I'm looking there, but I see you peripherally. The direct vision is gone. He didn't have one decent feature, but altogether he was gorgeous. So how do you see? Very handsome. To see is not uh, just that your eyes are open and they can take in a vision. It's being able to uh, really look so that you could learn about it. That's seeing. So how can you tell if something's beautiful? The only way to answer that is not intellectually, but um, sensually. Because beauty is uh, not intellectual, but sensual for me. So that when I look at something, it, it's an excitement, it's a love, and it's moving. It moves me emotionally. I can tell because it pleases me and I want to keep looking at it. I find it interesting quiet, and beautiful. This must get really annoying after a while. No, I'll adopt you. <laughs> I never had a son. I'm lucky to have vision. When you reach a really old age, uh, there has to be gratitude that you're there to see it. Mm -hmm. I'm around to see what my great-grandchildren are achieving. I'm very lucky to be a great-grandmother. I don't know that I'm very good. I try. I have unusually good grandchildren, all of them. They are very unusual. They are so good. They're smart, they're talented. 
and they're kind. They're wonderful. 96 years. What was the highlight? My marrying Morris and my children. That's the highlight. What you leave behind is a little bit of yourself. That these are what are called genes. And that's a highlight. I'm very lucky. I still have my head. My grandson uh, looks at me and says, one in 700. Usually people of my age are not living any longer, or if they are, they don't have much of a head anymore. But I can still think. So I'm very, very, very lucky and grateful for that. Good genes, I think, right? Bye. <laughs>